Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Scott Sanson's UBI Enterprise. So I've been reading this book, it's called Tyranny of Kindness, and it was published in 1993 by Teresa Funicello. I'm, I recommended this book at the bottom of my um, last article about Andrew Yang and his Freedom Dividend. I just think that this is so important that, that people have no idea the realities on the ground of welfare that this book is just full of these details that people don't know about. And so to encourage people to even read this book, I think what I've decided to do is I just want to read the first chapter aloud to to share this this with you so you all can hear this. And uh, I don't know maybe I can read more of it if it's um you know popular, but um I just want to make sure that everyone at least hears the the first chapter. So uh here we go. Chapter 1, The Mother's Shift I felt like I had a dreaded, contagious disease. The bacteria from the disease spread slowly. It took the strength from my muscles, causing me to feel ugly. It took the hope from my heart, causing me to feel discouraged. It took ideas from my mind, causing me to feel useless. It's a quote from Martha Maxwell, a welfare mother. Firefighters, returning from a false alarm in Queens, New York, one beautiful October day in 1989, were gazing into the sky when they passed a tall apartment complex. Ten stories up, a body was dangling from the window. They yelled up front to get the rig turned around. Just as it arrived, a little girl, naked, hit the ground. Hector Fabril and his partner ran to resuscitate her as two other firefighters dashed into the building. According to Faberl, quote, we tried to stabilize her. Just as she was breathing on her own, I heard people screaming. I couldn't imagine what the commotion was, because it looked like she was going to make it. I looked up and saw another small child spinning down, end quote. Witnesses said the mother had seemed to dangle him for a while before she let go of him. Rashid, age three, fell on his seven-year-old sister. After that, we couldn't get a pulse from her, and blood was spilling from her mouth. Fatima Ali, a 32-year-old middle-class Muslim housewife, was attempting to send all five of her children back to Allah through their apartment window. Her daughter, Taisha, was pronounced dead at the hospital. Rashid, critically injured, survived. Just as Ms. Ali was about to toss her one-year-old, firefighters burst into her apartment. As they were overtaking her, she urged the children to go quickly, as if they would go on their own. All were naked. According to one news report, she said, We came into this world with nothing, and that's how we're going to leave. Three children and their mother, who intended to jump when she completed the task, were rescued. Ms. Ali was charged with murder, attempted murder, first and second degree assault, reckless endangerment, and endangering the welfare of a child. Neighbors said the mother was loving and the children were always polite and clean, as if that somehow rendered the occurrence more mysterious. And then Fatima Ali and her children vanished from our collective memory, almost as swiftly as they had entered. When I was young, I could not possibly have understood or forgiven the acts of Fatima Ali. Some of that youth I spent as a Muslim, drapes for clothes, virtually non-stop prayers, my two feet of hair cordoned with a bolt of white cloth bound so tightly I could never really forget it was there. I took this religion as seriously as the religions that preceded it in my life, starting with Catholicism. I went to church every day till I was 18. My religion was as solid as a rock mountain, vulnerable only to major earthquakes and dripping water by the century. In later years, feminism finally crept up on me. In Islam, everything, from sex to eating, is ritualized. That's how I know that Fatima Ali was doing with apparent calm while she held Rashid out the window before letting go. She was praying. In form and function, as in other patriarchal religions, women in Islam are buried alive in an avalanche of contradictions. They are equal, no, superior, no, inferior to men, to snakes, to witches. The female self is sublimated under a mass of religious debris. Make no mistake, an Islamic woman without a man, especially a woman with children, isn't remotely like a fish without a bicycle. This woman had five children, aged one to eight years, and was recently separated from her husband. 
She had trouble making her last month's rent. She had been trapped in one alienating system and was about to become trapped in another. She surely feared a descent into poverty, alienation, and probably homelessness. After all, once removed from attachment to a man, her labor as a wife and mother was all but worthless. It would not have been difficult for her to imagine a terrifying future. The streets, welfare, welfare hotels, drugs, prostitution, guns, knives, gambling, drunkenness, and all matter of spiritual death. But for a woman with the option of deliverance, it wasn't inevitable. A homeless mother of five has virtually no chance of being taken in by friends or family for more than a night or two. In fact, were Ms. Ali to become homeless, she would have only a 16% chance of keeping her children with her for the duration of their homelessness. The odds are not that much better for mothers of fewer children, it would be more typical. In all cases, relatively young mothers and their children who find themselves suddenly without the income of a father or the unlikely trust fund might bring in are in a situation fraught with peril. If the Ali family had become homeless, exactly what would have happened cannot be said with absolute certainty. Still, there are commonalities shared by women of all races and religions, from coast to coast, experiencing either rural or urban poverty. The merciless anxiety and humiliation of being shuttled back and forth like herded animals, the stress of keeping kids in school are constant. Only the little details vary. In New York City, if she were able to keep her family together, at some point they would approach an emergency assistance unit, which is obligated to shelter them in some way. This would mean waiting for hours, sometimes days, on plastic chairs, metal desks, or the bare floor. If the family didn't eat pork, they'd eat nothing, since bologna sandwiches would be about all they'd get for the next several meals. Some nights, often after midnight, they might be placed in a roach, lice, and rat-infested welfare hotel for just a few hours till a more permanent, equally squalid temporary placement was arranged. First thing in the morning, the family would be roused and shuttled back to the EAU to wait again. If they were extremely lucky, they would finally be placed in a welfare hotel, or transitional shelter together. The latter often provide less space per family member than is required of jail cells. Because the Ali family is so large, they wouldn't even get apartment referrals from city workers until after they'd been in this hell for many months. One rural homeless mother told me her family was placed in a motel with bars where windows should have been, and without a store or school within walking distance. Every time she needed something, she was at the mercy of a barely functional shuttle system for homeless people. At first, many mothers try to continue taking their children to their previous schools. In New York City, this usually means traveling with them, other babies in tow, to another borough in the morning and returning for them in the afternoon. When one of the children is too sick to travel, none will go to school. After a while, mothers might try to place their children in a school closer to the shelter. Legal, yes. Easy, no. If a mother accomplishes this, sooner or later, other kids in the new school will realize that her kids are untouchables. School life will become anathema to her kids. They'll begin to adopt the coping mechanisms of the homeless kids who will associate with them. Night brings scant respite. Sounds of sirens, gunshots from outside or down the hall, families fighting, too many people in too few beds, often with neither sheets nor blankets, much less pillows. The mattresses have long since burst like pastry puffs, and each day finds more of their insides outside. Bed bugs pinch. Those who are lucky have a little stove in the room. I will never forget the first time I used such a stove in a welfare hotel. I had just added eggs to the frying pan when swarms of roaches scrambled out of the fire in every direction, including right into the frying pan. It was days before I could bring myself to try it again. The things most people take for granted become little horrors, each stacked on top of the one before. If the Ali family were to emerge from the temporary shelter intact and be placed in an apartment, the rest of the world would think their problem solved, but they would still be only beginning. Almost any place the family could expect to live would be its own ghoulish chamber, but now the family would be a welfare family. Overnight, social policy would swerve away from even the pretense of caring. Ms. Ali would change from pitied social victim to society's victimizer. Her living conditions would not improve, nor would her stress diminish. 
Her agony would not subside, but she would be stripped of her poverty rank, joining the much larger class of poor women, the thoroughly despised abusers of the system, welfare mothers. To have come this far would have been a heroic feat, but it would be said of her that she's a drain on the national resources, has too many children, she shouldn't have had if she couldn't afford to, and doesn't, quote, work. Like most welfare mothers, Ms. Ali will raise her children without the modern conveniences most mothers take for granted. No washing machines, often no heat in the winter or utilities in the summer. The baby will be likely to sleep in a cardboard box or dresser drawer because even a second-hand crib is too expensive. Shopping for food will become an exploit. Supermarkets are rarely accessible because they often don't exist where poor women live and transportation to them can be prohibitively expensive. She will raise her kids in a high-crime neighborhood, teeming with drug abuse and other life-defeating modes of survival. If any woman were absolutely penniless today and went to apply for welfare to feed her children, she would not receive her first welfare check for about a month. This is not because the welfare is prohibited from giving money any sooner, but because they are allowed to take 30 days to determine the obvious that she is poor. The 30-day deadline might come and go with no relief, or if she makes it into welfare, destructive policies combined with bureaucratic bungling might cut her off despite her continued eligibility. This happens to at least one million needy families in the United States every year. This process has been given the name churning by the welfare department itself, as people are routinely cut off only to be put back on again months later. Once on welfare, a family's chances of having enough money to live in a remotely decent neighborhood and pay for all basic human needs are nil, even in New York, where welfare benefits are said to be high. On the sunny day in 1989, when the Ali family almost came to a total halt, the maximum monthly grant in New York City for a mother and five children was $814.20, or less than three-fifths of the federal poverty threshold for the same size family. The average New York grant for six was approximately $655 per month. The average family on welfare has only three persons, a mother and two children. In New York City, the average grant for a three-person family was about $441 per month. Assuming the Ali family received the maximum, the rent allotment would have been $349. Assuming the absurd, that they could find habitable housing for that price in New York, or most any other U.S. city, they would be left with $465.20, or about $2.50 per person per day for most of their food. Food stamps would have provided less than two weeks of nutritionally adequate food for the month. That same 250 must also cover some medical expenses and all utilities. Toothpaste, toilet paper, furniture, soap, baby bottles, diapers, laundry, transportation, kitchen utensils, clothing, and so on. If Ms. Ali lived in South Dakota, she'd have just about $1.88 for all those things. In New York, if she took one ride on the subway in search of the elusive job, she would use up more than 90% of her daily ration. If she were menstruating and needed to buy a box of tampons, she would have to dip into her children's share. There is no state in the country where welfare benefits reach the poverty line, though 20 years ago they did in some states, including New York. Like millions of women, Ms. Ali had only one commodity at her disposal guaranteed to provide sufficient income in the short term to keep her family together, her body. To a devout Muslim, as to many others, even survival does not justify such a damning act. And from her perspective, to kill only herself would have been irresponsible. Had Mr. Ali died instead of leaving, things would have been very different. First, Ms. Ali would then have been the recipient of universal sympathy and support. As a widow with minor children, she would have become a social security survivor or widow instead of a welfare mother. The maximum family benefit for survivor families on social security in 1989, $1,896 per month, could have been enough to continue living modestly where she was. While this sum is hardly lavish, the family would have remained above poverty. And no bureaucrats social policy experts, politicians, or journalists would have gone nuts because she didn't have a, quote, job. 
In fact, she would have been thought to be a good mother for taking care of her children full time, at least while they were young. If and when she did get a paying job, she could earn thousands of dollars without any reduction in her social security check. When the threshold was reached at which her social security would begin to be taxed, it would be 50 cents on the dollar. On welfare, income from a job would have been taxed at 100% rate. From day one, aside from minimal work-related expenses and negligible bonus for working outside the home, her welfare check would be reduced a dollar for every dollar she was paid. No one has suggested the mother in Social Security suffers from, quote, dependency. Yet everyone seems concerned about dependency when it comes to welfare. There is no rational public policy bias for treating families in essentially identical circumstances in such radically different ways. It was the very same act, the Social Security Act of 1935, that created both these income maintenance programs. The only real difference between survivor and welfare families, then and now, is the imprimatur of the father. The message? The needs and rights of women and children are determined not by universal standards, but by the nature of their prior relationship to a man. Why punish the mother and children for the negligence or inability of the father to provide? Over 90% of the adults on welfare are women with children. Children are poor because their mothers are poor. Financially secure mothers don't know the gritty details, but they can be certain in some deep place that if the economic rug is pulled out from under them, they and their children may never recover. Fatima Ali's tragic acts may not have been so mysterious after all. Choosing exposure to untold evils for your children can be like choosing death, if not of the body, then of the spirit. The miracle is why more women facing similar crises don't do the same. My own rude awakening came when in my mid-twenties I became a welfare mother. I was single and had a baby whose father was better at providing fear than the necessities of life. When my daughter was three months old, I kicked him out. It had finally dawned on me that he, one, might kill me one of these days, two, might try to hurt her, or three, might kill us both in one of his blind drunks. I didn't dwell on the consequences of kicking him out. I didn't even think about having to go on welfare. Even if I had thought about it, the result would have been the same. My father was dead, and my mother lived on Social Security. My father had been superstitious, so he had no private life insurance. In any event, without parents or other resources to fall back on, I did what I had to do. I soon became slave to what we welfare mothers in New York called, quote, the welfare. It is a crude and irrational system of income distribution, usually capricious and often downright cruel. I have spent the better part of my adult life trying to figure it out. During the first four of those years, I was on and off the rolls intermittently. The first time I applied for welfare was in early December of 1973. I was crushed when I received no welfare check until after Christmas. I experienced a profound sadness for my three-month-old daughter on Christmas Eve. Her future seemed to loom so bleak. I wasn't the crying type, but every now and then I felt these tears rolling down my cheeks, almost as if they belonged to someone else. A year and a half later, I got a summer job miles from where we lived, so I had to move. Since the job was in a resort town, I couldn't afford to live there either. We moved from one county to another, and I worked in still a third. I had a hunch that I might be entitled to some help with childcare expenses, but I didn't have anyone besides the welfare department to ask. I did that in all three counties. I was told that I didn't qualify for daycare because daycare meant daytime and I worked nights. This, as it turned out, was not true, but at the time, I didn't know it. What's more, though I was also entitled to other supplemental welfare benefits, of which I was equally ignorant, I never got them either. Instead, because I took the job, I was cut off welfare entirely, lost my food stamps and my Medicaid. The job paid more than a minimum wage. Nonetheless, I was worse off than before. First, I worked nights, like many single mothers, so that I could spend most of my daughter's waking hours with her. This meant that she was sleeping while I was awake, and I had to be awake when she was. By Labor Day, I was, to put it mildly, overtired, overweary, overstrained, overdriven, overfatigued, overspent, 
and worn out. There were countless problems associated with money. In theory, I had more than when we were on welfare. In practice, it wasn't quite the case. On welfare, I could wear whatever passed for clothes without giving much thought to it. On my paying job, the expectations were not so lax. I had less energy for cooking items like dried beans half the day, baking bread, or fashioning nutritious soups out of assorted food scraps. I was living in a small city now, so I could not grow any food because I had no garden in which to sow seeds. I quickly discovered that the faster the food, the more it cost. I also had the expense of traveling back and forth to this job five nights a week. Not only did this extract gas dollars, but my car had a seemingly endless capacity to languish in the mechanics when I couldn't figure out how to fix it myself. Getting sick was out of the question. Not only would I go unpaid if I didn't show up at work, but I could not afford a doctor for myself under any circumstances, and I would have been reluctant to take my daughter to one had she gotten sick. By far the most traumatic dilemma for both me and the baby, though, was childcare. I could afford very little. Capitulating to the social pressure to be off welfare, I left my daughter at age one and a half with people who could not begin to match my parenting skills. And for what? For her? For me? For money? Or so people would stop watching what I bought at the grocery store. When you pull out your food stamps at a checkout counter, all eyes within 50 feet, with the exception of those like you, who will be soon facing the music, run a quick tabulation and analysis of your purchases. When that job ended, I went to a state employment office in Albany, looking for better paying work. Foolishly, I told the truth on my application. When the employment official found out I was a single mother who had recently been on welfare, he told me he was not allowed to refer me for a job. He explained that the department had to compete with private employment firms and that it was customary not to send single mothers out for job interviews since employers generally didn't want them, no matter what their skills were. At the time, there was a coding system at employment agencies to tell prospective interviewers in advance such things as your marital status, for women only, and the color of your skin, for non-whites, of course. This ensured that certain undesirable types didn't get sent on interviews. Another staff person approached me and asked if I would like to file a lawsuit against them for the practice, saying he could get me a free lawyer, I give it only brief consideration. My political consciousness at this time was, to say the least, limited. I also figured that if I went along with them, I'd be stuck on welfare for years to come while I waited around for this lawsuit. Instead, just after my daughter's second birthday, in September of 1975, I moved to New York City. I was convinced we'd never escape poverty if I couldn't find better paying work, so I went stalking opportunity in the city. As it turned out, I was shortly looking to get back on welfare, finding no job coupled with acceptable childcare screaming out for my skills such as they were. There didn't seem to be much of a market for brains, and I couldn't type. I could only answer one phone line at a time. I had a college degree acquired on scholarships, but it wasn't worth much in a city teeming with hundreds of thousands of other baby boom graduates, many of whom had connections and no babies. I went to the welfare with all my papers and baby in tow. After waiting interminable days for an appointment, I was finally told that I didn't qualify because I didn't have a place to live. I said that I didn't have any place to live because I didn't have any money with which to rent an apartment, and if they would just help me, I could remedy that. I was sent packing. In no time, I obtained a letter from a friend saying I lived in her apartment and went back to the welfare, only this time at another center to avoid being recognized. New York City had some 46 welfare centers at the time. One out of every 11 welfare recipients in the country lives there. I went through the same process, filling out reams of forms and waiting anxiously for my appointment. There was a sign on the wall in the center stating, No matter what time your appointment is, if you are not here by 8.30 a.m., you will not be seen. After examining my application, the intake worker told me we were not eligible for welfare because we had no furniture. I started to panic but refrained from strangling her. She told me to go back where I had come from, but I couldn't. When I got enough of a grip on myself to act, I realized that I needed to know what you had to have, not simply what you didn't have, to get on welfare in New York. Because, though I didn't have any of it, I was willing to say I did. 
Of course, what they were telling me was not true, but once again, I was not privy to that little piece of information. Even if I had known, I wouldn't have had the slightest idea what to do about it. I converted one of the few dollars I had left into dimes, got hold of a phone book, and proceeded to call organizations listed in the yellow pages. After a series of unproductive calls, it occurred to me to call New York now. I had noticed, after all, that most of the people in the centers were women with kids. I had heard from a friend who was on welfare, but with whom I was unable to get in touch, that there was some kind of welfare mothers group in New York, and I inquired about it. They actually knew of it and gave me the number for the Downtown Welfare Advocate Center, DWAC, which whites usually pronounced phonetically and blacks pronounced with a flair I preferred, DWAC. Some weeks later, with the help of a law student, John Morkin, who volunteered at the center, I received a welfare check and got a room in an apartment share for my baby and me. John and my friend Ann Phillips kept trying to convince me to come to DWAC some Sunday for meetings of welfare mothers who talked about their problems and about the notion of welfare rights, whatever that was. Having virtually no political interests, I was disinclined. Sometime later, I finally relented. There were only a handful of women present at the meeting that first day I went. I don't remember what I expected, but it was more or less a consciousness-raising session for welfare mothers. It was 1975, and little did I know that I would be involved with this organization for more than a decade. One woman there, Diana Volker, was particularly impressive. She had grown up on the streets of New York, been a gang member. She too was a welfare mother, with a beautiful blonde child about seven years old. Diana acted tough, but I was later to find out that was all cover. Throughout the meeting, she, and to some extent the others, was organizing me, although I didn't know it at the time. Diana said things like, They try to make you feel guilty, like you've done something wrong. There's nothing wrong with you. It's the system that's all screwed up. You're a mother, and that's a job, and it's an important one. There was a poster on the wall that said, Women hold up half the sky. I came back the next Sunday, and the next. I learned the history of this organization. Diana was one of the founders, along with Anita Hoffman, Abby's wife. When Abby went underground, Anita and their son, then called America, had to go on welfare. As I understand it, Abby had made a fair amount of money on his books, but much of it was given away and the rest was spent on his legal defense. Suddenly thrust into this alien world of welfare, Anita felt politically abandoned by most of their former friends. So she started this consciousness-raising group of welfare mothers. Soon the women realized that they needed to know what their legal rights were, as the welfare was so unpredictable in responding to people's needs. Other women heard about the group through the grapevine and called Anita with increasing frequency to ask for advice. Given her prominence in the, quote, progressive community, she was able to raise a small amount of seed money for office space and a phone. Supplies like paper, pens, scissors, tape, and glue were usually supplied piecemeal, often from other people's offices. When I started at DWAC, Anita was weary from the nearly overwhelming tasks of keeping the place afloat, and she rarely showed up in the meetings. In fact, I only met her twice before she went underground to join Abby with America. She struck me as a truly creative thinker. Clearly, she had a broader vision of the Downtown Welfare Advocate Center as a political force. Had she remained involved, the organization may have evolved pretty much as it ultimately did. Some years after she resurfaced from the underground, we met again. She told me that welfare was the true radicalizing experience of her life. Six months after I first walked in the door, I started to talk in the meetings. There are those who would say I haven't shut up since. I also began working there full time. I didn't get paid for it in the beginning, but I did get free childcare. There were two phones in the room ostensibly for different grassroots self-help organizations, but most of the calls that came in were from welfare mothers, or prospective ones, with problems. If I had to work alone, I'd run from desk to desk, answering the nearly non-stop rings in spite of the fact that I knew almost nothing about welfare in New York. I promised to look up answers for people, but usually could not call them back, as they were at pay phones, so I would get answers and wait to hear back from them. Virtually every caller was in a state of terror I knew well. Fortunately, between the books and manuals in the office, the other women who sometimes also worked there, and the occasional welfare lawyer or law student willing to advise me, I was usually able to respond effectively. 
In time, I became the organization's de facto leader. Women called or came in from every borough of the city. They came by the droves. Even a woman named Whoopi Goldberg called for help a couple of times. We were getting about 200 calls a week. I began to wonder how they got our number, so we started asking. We compiled a list of over 100 agencies throughout the city that referred people to us. They ran the gamut from the gigantic, like the Community Service Society, the largest privately endowed social welfare organization in New York, to the local multi-service centers scattered around the city's neighborhoods. The police sent women. The welfare workers sent women. The public library sent women. Hospitals, firefighters, colleges, even the Red Cross. All of them had substantial budgets. Hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. To say the least, they were well-funded. And why they didn't do more than refer so many people on to us was beyond me at the time. We had almost nothing. No paid staff. No amenities. In the winter, we worked with our coats on. In the summer, we sweltered. I knew nothing about the politics of social welfare and had no preconceived notions about the, quote, helping organizations or the players in them. This, too, I would learn. Helping women with the constant welfare hassles and their byproducts brought me into contact with hundreds and even thousands of lives. They were all types. Some started out poor, and even if they had previously had a poorly paying job, found themselves in need of welfare. Others had Medicaid or food stamp problems. Some had been middle class until hubby split and they landed right where the rest of us did. There were even a few who had been married to very wealthy men, millionaires who refused to support either their former wives or their current children. Welfare was the great equalizer. It was often said at that time that every woman was only one man away from welfare. For the most part, it was true. As I met more welfare mothers, I was struck by the number who had lost children. One Christmas, the news reported that a baby had died in a heatless apartment in New York. At the office, we jumped to the logical conclusion that the family was poor and probably on welfare. When we spoke to the doctor at the hospital, he told us the only unusual thing about this case was that it was reported in the news media. He maintained that this was a fairly common occurrence in poor communities. The cause of death is never listed as poverty, though. Pneumonia, hypothermia, heart failure, and the like are medical terms obscuring the truth. A little more digging revealed the unreported facts. The infant had been hospitalized earlier in the week, but had been discharged. The mother was a single parent on welfare with two other children. She was also on what is called a two-party rent check. These checks can only be cashed when both recipient and the landlord endorse them, effectively ensuring payment to the landlord regardless of housing conditions. The mother had no heat, which was the responsibility of the landlord in this case, no hot water, and no electricity. She was also on recoupments, which means that her welfare check was being garnished by up to 15% to pay back in advance or loan that had been provided by welfare to cover a previous emergency. The night of the incident was particularly cold, even for late December. She put all three of her children in bed with her in the hope of keeping them warm. In the morning, two of her children woke up next to a dead infant. At the time, had her total welfare budget been sufficient to meet the state's definition of need, the mother and her children would have been at considerable risk. However, her total cash grant was about 50% less than the state itself had deemed necessary when it set the so-called standard of need in 1970. At most, she could have been getting $218 a month for rent for a four-person family, all of which was designated for the landlord. This portion of her grant was completely unavailable to her for self-help measures, such as more blankets, because of the two-party check. The non-rent portion of her grant, often called the basic grant, would normally have been $258 per month, but since she was on recoupments, she was getting less. Her maximum available cash income would have been between $1.51 and $1.70 per person per day. If her infant needed shoes and baby's feet changed sizes every three months or so, she would have had to starve the other kids, each of whom would also soon be needing shoes, for a few days or go without some other essential. Clearly, she was going without a lot of essentials. If she needed toilet paper and soap, 
On the same day, she had to do the laundry, at the laundromat, no doubt. The whole family's allotment for the day would be gone. This was in the heyday of Jimmy Carter's presidency, and what was considered a liberal, almost lavish with respect to its poor state. Another survivor I became acquainted with was actually a grandmother who was being recouped for spending her rent money on a crib for her grandchild. She came to see me for advice about her recoupment. I did the calculations on her budget and discovered that the Human Resources Administration, HRA, New York City's euphemism for the Welfare Department, was taking back more than she owed. At first, Aretha's story seemed like a fairly ordinary one. We just had to get the welfare to stop the recoupments and pay her back the excess. As I was finishing the details of her case, she began explaining why she'd used the rent money. Her daughter had a baby, and she didn't have money for a crib. No one they knew had one available to lend them. Aretha had good reason to worry. Only a year earlier, her own son, for whom she had not had a crib, had died of lead poisoning. She was convinced that a crib would have prevented him from getting at the paint chips. It had been impossible to see and stop him every time he put one in his mouth. He was diagnosed with lead poisoning when he was two. He died at nine. He had been an invalid all his short life, never got out of diapers, never walked, barely learned to talk. He never went to school. Aretha was never able to leave him and take a job outside the home, as she had done before he was born. She had repeatedly asked her social worker to allow them to move to a different apartment. Her file at the welfare department was a foot thick with requests and rejections. Two weeks after her son died, they moved her. I met Aretha about 15 years ago. What I didn't know then is that I would come to know many like her. Every time I see a welfare baby sleeping in a cardboard box or a dresser drawer, I think about Aretha. By almost any measure, poverty is the number one killer of children in the United States. Doctors don't say so, at least not in so many words, because poverty isn't a medical affliction. It's an economic and social one. It kills all the same. Twelve times as many poor children as non-poor children die in fires. Eight times as many die of disease, according to a study done by the state of Maine, where, by the way, 98% of the population is white. Thirty times as many low birth weight babies die as normal weight babies in the United States. In 1987, one in two homeless mothers in New York reported losing weight during pregnancy. Even at the bottom, luck plays a distinct role. Whose kid is hit by a stray bullet? Whose kitchen stove explodes because it was used nonstop as the only source of heat in a frozen apartment? Whose infant dies of pneumonia? These figures and the ghastly, tragic stories that lie behind them are the results of the failure of U.S. social policy. Murder by Malfeasance It is not a secret to anyone who lives in an, quote, inner city, or to the public officials whose policies create the conditions. However, most people in the United States have never been to an inner city. There are many all across the land, few or worse than East New York in Brooklyn. The majority of the families there are on fixed incomes, usually welfare. I once brought a UNICEF organizer from Bombay into East New York at his request. He was so stunned there were tears in his eyes. He told me that the conditions there were more life-threatening than those of the poorest people in Bombay. Another outsider I took there said it reminded him of the pictures he had seen after the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. I can't say these reactions were surprising. I had been there many times before. It was certainly life-threatening. On one occasion, Jackie Goings, a member of DWAC, asked me to accompany her to see a young white woman with two small children who lived in East New York. Until recently, they had lived in a welfare hotel. Like most of the homeless families who get apartments following a period in the city's shelter system, she had no real choice but where she was sent. Jackie, who was a black grandmother, had met this woman at a welfare center and was concerned, among other reasons, because although this was not a safe neighborhood for anyone, it could be particularly alienating for a young white family since virtually everyone else in the neighborhood was black or Hispanic. When we arrived at the building, we saw notices posted from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, indicating that the place had been condemned and that no one at all was supposed to be living there. However, the Welfare Department was clearly not only not moving families out, but continuing to move people in. 
The condition of the building spoke volumes. The stone steps leading up to the entrance were jagged and cracked in half. The front door, obviously, had once been finely crafted of wrought iron and glass, but all the glass had been broken out of it except random shards. There was no lock on the door. Without even turning the handle, we were able to push our way in. At the entryway was a second door, a solid metal door. This one would have served well to keep out unwanted intruders. Except that where there should have been a doorknob and lock, there was only a hole. Another light push and we were inside. A bare bulb lit our way. The first apartment on our left had no door at all. The only living residents in it were rats and vermin. It was literally a garbage dump, and obviously had been for some time. Paint was peeling, the plaster crumbling, and the walls were actually buckling everywhere we looked. The stairway in front of us was an obstacle course of broken steps and debris from the ceiling. Fortunately, we didn't need to use it. The woman we had come to visit lived on the first floor to our right. We knocked and were greeted by a black woman and her kids, who seemed to be waiting for us. She told us that Lydia would be back soon. For some odd reason, Lydia had to leave, even though she knew we were coming. We were nonetheless welcome to wait. Had I not seen other residences like it before, I would have been shocked. There were two, quote, rooms to this apartment, a kitchen and another open space off it. There was a stove in the kitchen with no knobs, so it clearly didn't work. The mother had converted it into a shelf to hold salt and hot sauce, a few dishes and a glass. A nearby sink had cold water on tap, no hot. There was enough space for a table and chairs, but there were neither. There was a refrigerator, but it didn't work. I wondered silently if it was left there by HBD for the kids to play in. Some milk and a few other food items were lined up on the window sill, which functioned fairly well as a refrigeration unit because the window panes were almost all broken and it was December. Lydia had obviously attempted to do some repair work on her own. Dark green garbage bags were taped across the wounded panes. Still, the place was quite cold. The only source of warmth was a once-upon-a-time toaster oven, the innards of which were fully exposed and red with heat. The wire leading out of the oven was frayed every few inches, and where it plugged into the socket, the wall was charred black. The only piece of furniture in the entire apartment was a single cot. Keep in mind, this apartment housed a woman with two children. Over in the far corner was a broken stroller and two little stacks of neatly folded clothes. These were all the worldly possessions of this family. Lydia, too, had been a victim of spouse abuse, becoming homeless with nothing to her name except two small children. Putting her in this apartment without essential furniture and kitchen equipment, much less heat, was of course not proper procedure. Forget that the building was condemned. We had been waiting for some time when the woman across the hall came to ask if we would look in her apartment too. So we did. Anna, a short, plump Puerto Rican woman, had only one child who looked about two or three years old. She was a lovely little girl with her arm in a cast. We were told that she fell, but I felt a wave of nausea as I wondered what she could possibly have fallen off of to have broken her arm. I suspected, as did Jackie, that a boyfriend factored into this household. It struck me that, unlike most other welfare mothers I knew, Anna seemed to be singularly unintelligent. How would she survive if pushed into a forced work program? Anna had a stove that worked and served the dual functions of cooking, and to a lesser extent heating. Her apartment had the same mechanism for refrigeration as Lydia's. What she didn't have was tap water neither hot nor cold, at least not in the kitchen. She took us to the bathroom, which did have water, spraying out of the upper walls. Inside the tub, chunks of plaster from the ceiling floated in a pool of rust-colored water collected from above. Adding humor to the homespun charm, Anna had rigged an umbrella over the toilet seat to minimize the forced shower that accompanied any attempt to relieve oneself. There was one anomaly in the bathroom that I'll never forget. It was a brand new little pink sink. Anna said it had been installed about six months previously by HPD, but no one ever returned to finish the job, so it never produced water. She told us it was the only time during the two years she had been there that any work was done on her apartment. We were interrupted by a commotion from upstairs, prompting us to go out into the hall. Jackie had been informed that a gang of young hoodlums had taken over an upstairs apartment from which drugs were being sold and neighbors terrorized. One young thug with menacing eyes came down to tell us to get the fuck out of the building. He claimed to be quite certain that Lydia would not be back any time soon. Throughout the short time we'd been there, a dozen or more young men had come and gone. Soon, five or six of them swelled into the stairway. A door on one of the upper floors creaked open, 
and an old black man in a t-shirt peered down at us through the banisters. He was the only other male in the building. Sadly, he knew he was no match for the young men. Neither were we. So we left for the night, making our way through the phalanx of young men then milling around the stoop. This building and the people in it are not a composite, not a figment of anyone's imagination. I was there. How many people live like this? There was no absolute raw data, but judging from the waiting list for public housing in the city, which only the fairly desperate want to get into, the number is now in excess of 250,000 families. About half the inner city families are on welfare, and another 10% receive some form of public assistance. Across the country, the total must exceed a million, and a million families translates to about 3 million people. They are not measurably better off than homeless families, but they are out of sight until something like the riots in South Central Los Angeles. Then everyone asks, why? For most on welfare, life is an intense survival struggle, always robbing Peter to pay Paul except you're always Peter, and somebody else is always Paul. Sometimes experiencing a festering desperation, a sense of being swallowed alive. Still there are times that are happy. Poor babies smile and coo like any other babies. On many occasions, those of us who worked at DWAC pooled our money for someone worse off than ourselves. We knew without any question what she wanted and needed, and we left the decision on spending it to her. A family who had been burned out might need emergency clothing, diapers at the very least. On occasion, a family would show up living in a car, desperate for food while waiting for a welfare determination, a process that would take longer if the family applied for, quote, emergency assistance than if they applied without mentioning the word emergency. When a child died, friends and neighbors went into action, determined to help get the child buried. The first time I participated in this morbid ritual, known only to poor communities, was when the son of one of our leaders died. At the time, the welfare would give only up to $250 for the burial. Problem was, no undertaker would do the job for $250. This left two options. First, the child could be given over to the city to be buried in an unmarked pauper's grave, usually far from where the mother lived. Most mothers simply cannot bear to have their dead offspring carted away, never to be able to visit their grave sites. The second option was to raise the money necessary for a proper burial. Those who could, those who had at least a few close relatives or neighborhoods in the community, chose this option. However, once enough money was available to move the undertaker to action, the welfare would refuse, as a matter of written policy, to give the $250. They would argue that if a woman could raise the additional cash necessary to bury a child, she must have access to resources she had failed to report in the past. Even upon the death of a child, the Byzantine logic of the welfare always prevailed, and it masked a cruelty of immeasurable proportions visited upon the poorest citizens of one of the wealthiest nations in the world. The horrors continued to parade through our day-to-day -day lives at DWAC. Each new crisis intensified our need to understand why and to figure out how to change the system. The personal was indeed political and vice versa. In those early years at DWAC, we believed that if we could simply tell people what was happening to very poor people, someone would put a stop to it. We thought all we had to do was make it public, take these invisible private nightmares and expose them for all the world to see. We couldn't have begun to understand how hard this would be to accomplish, how difficult it would be to reveal the simple truth, how much myth was attached to welfare, and what forces would be brought to bear to prevent us from telling our story. How do you make public what so many people more powerful than you are trying their damnedest to, to keep secret? Short of owning your own television network or the lion's share of the stock in the New York Times, your opportunities for mass communication are pitiful. Freedom of the press, as they say, belongs to those who own one. Bad enough you've got this sob story to tell, but you're trying to tell it about the dirtiest word in the English language, welfare. It's a word that curdles on most people's tongues, whether they are living under its tyranny as recipients or living with the belief that it's picking their pockets. Almost no one has a dispassionate view of welfare. Fortunately, we didn't know all that when we started. We only knew that welfare was an American tragedy that others needed to know about, and that work outside the home for a poor single woman with kids was rarely any better and often even worse. Besides, the system was personal for me and most of the women who came to work at DWAC. In the beginning, most of us couldn't see our own way out, 
but we weren't going to let it bury us without a fight. Too much had happened to us individually and vicariously, through the women who continued to come to us for help. We knew we had to act collectively, or life on welfare would continue to be a constant game of Russian roulette, whose participants did not have to be willing, but would have to play. It was against this backdrop of a million personal tragedies, hundreds of whom came to us each week, that we sought to insert our voices and theirs into the public debate on poverty and welfare policies and practices. There were just a few little problems. We were poor individually and organizationally. We were political lepers, and we didn't know anything about building a political base. And that was just for starters. So that's the end of chapter one. But I think I just want to read the first like few pages of chapter two, actually, because it gets into kind of the details of the bureaucracy, which uh, I, I really want people to get a taste of as well. So chapter two. The Brutality of the Bureaucracy Think of the worst experience you've ever had with a clerk in some government service job, motor vehicles, hospital, whatever, and add the life-threatening condition of impending starvation or homelessness to the waiting line. Multiply the anxiety by an exponent of 10, and you have some idea of what it's like in a welfare center. You wait and wait, shuttling back and forth in various lines like cattle to the slaughter. You want to wring the workers' necks, but you don't dare talk back. The slightest remark can set your case back hours, days, weeks, or forever. Occasionally someone loses it and starts cursing at the top of her lungs. Then she's carted away by security guards. In the early days, I thought this meant she was getting served faster for having had the nerve to lay it all out. It wasn't long before it became evident that these were among the ones who would be arrested and sometimes beaten up. It's truly amazing that more welfare workers aren't killed. The torment so many of them inflict would break the patience of anyone whose life wasn't on the line. But that's always their ace in the hole. No check, no life. Babies and other small children are squirming all over the place, and always at least one worker shoots verbal bullets if they cry or run around. Half the time they're hungry as well as bored, but the mother has run out of the food she brought had none to begin with, or can't leave to get some for fear her number will be called while she's out tracking down an apple, candy bar, or quart of milk. If she yells at the kid, a worker yells at her. If she doesn't yell at the kid, a worker yells at her. You run the same risk taking one of the kids or yourself to the bathroom, so accidents are common. In any event, the bathrooms in welfare centers are not to be believed. The stalls have no doors, and there's rarely any toilet paper. If they are ever cleaned, it must be on holidays. They are putrid with the stench of weeks-old rags piled up anywhere because there are usually no bins to put them in. You could yearn for the good life in a prison after walking into a welfare center bathroom. Not all workers were ghouls, but they all had to contend with their own predicaments too. What should have happened and didn't was in many ways the consequence of the draw. What worker you got on what day of the week? Most workers know little about the actual law governing eligibility for public assistance, and even those who start out with good intentions often get blown away by the ever-changing legal script. Each month, new regulations by the dozens are distributed. Most of the workers are so overwhelmed with the sheer volume of clients that only the truly stalwart keep up with the changes. On the one side, the department is constantly trying to figure itself out so as to minimize waste and abuse. On the other, slews of lawsuits are constantly changing policies out of compliance with state or federal laws. And because most lawmakers are oblivious of the Constitution as it pertains to poor people, it is not uncommon for laws that are unconstitutional to be passed, put into operation, challenged, and overturned. A welfare worker in Kingston, New York, once told one of our members, When you sign up for welfare, that's when you sign all your rights away. Though this attitude is pervasive throughout the system, it is simply not true. If you have the uncanny lack of getting a worker who knows the law, you also have to get that person on a good day, which makes all the difference between being treated decently and being treated inhumanely. Inhumanity, by the nature of the job, is the more common treatment. God forbid your worker had a fight with a family member that morning. If the worker has previously been on welfare herself, she might be more helpful. But it's more likely that she'll be more bitter about having to work at this low-paying, 
essentially dead-end job while someone else makes off with a welfare check. Still other workers have this attitude that the welfare is coming right out of their pockets, an outlook the hierarchy likes to cultivate. Some welfare centers even had a system of rewards for intake workers who denied the most applications or cut off the most recipients in a given period. When you walk into a center, you have the right to get and file an application. To do that, you must first be deemed worthy of one by the person whose job it is to hand them out and initiate the herding process. Often people never get past point one because the worker who is obligated by law to give you that application not to question or determine your eligibility often refuses to do so. When that happens, people who are rejected at the door, who have no resources to turn to for advice, just fall through the cracks. They are included in no statistics, anywhere. For all practical intents and purposes, from the state's point of view, they do not exist unless they have submitted an application. At DWAC, we used to get many people with this problem. There had to be thousands of others because we were such a small, virtually unknown operation at the time. Getting the application into the hands of an intake worker who will interview you and check that you have proper documentation like birth certificates, leases, and social security numbers is the next hurdle. We were convinced that some of the workers were sadists and would find any excuse to humiliate an applicant, like the one who raged that an applicant was using a verboten red pen. The applicant had made a quarter inch mark on the form, not even completing the first letter of her name. You can't use red ink, bellowed the application approver nearby. Okay, the applicant switched to black ink and continued. But over an hour later, as the applicant handed the worker the completed form in black ink, she was told that the entire application was no good because of the tiny red mark on it. This worker, whose job was to look at applications to determine if they were completely filled out, simply refused to pass the form on to the intake worker. She insisted the applicant do the whole thing over again. She could have told her to get a new form the moment she spotted the red mark. She could have simply handed her another. She could have ignored the obviously irrelevant red mark. But this may have been the only part of her life in which she held the reins of power. She obviously liked it. There is no rational, uniform method for qualifying for welfare. The attitude of the worker prevails on the one end and that of the state on the other, with rules of the federal government subject to the politics of the moment having some jurisdiction over all. At a minimum, there are 50 administrative systems for welfare, one in each state. That's then subdivided into whatever local categories the state chooses, like by county. In New York at the time, to qualify for welfare under the best of circumstances, you could have zero dollars in your possession. And if you had outside income from a job or child support, it had to be less than the maximum you could have gotten on welfare if you had nothing. As a practical matter, if you walked in and said you had $50 to your name, which the worker would know could not possibly last until your case was accepted, you could not qualify for welfare. If you had any asset whatsoever that the workers deemed sellable, like an old wedding ring, it had to be sold. All your resources had to be expended before you were eligible. One of the few things that improved, for New Yorkers at least during the Reagan administration, was the establishment of a $1,000 resource limit, which meant an applicant could hold on to any asset deemed worth less than $1,000 and still qualify as long as all the other income requirements were met. In states like Mississippi, Income of more than $48 a month for a three-person family would, as a practical matter, disqualify them for welfare eligibility. In New York City, the maximum possible benefit for a three-person family at that time was $332. Job or other outside net income would have to be less than that. When the intake worker gets through with you, the case supervisor normally has the final thumbs up or down. So all the variables that affected your outcome with the intake worker are once again operative with the supervisor. The case supervisor can demand that you see still other workers to approve this or that required document or answer on your 17-page application form. You can be sent to a dozen places before a determination is made. Pregnant women virtually ready to give birth must supply a doctor's verification of their pregnancies. Processing the application takes weeks, sometimes even months. In spite of the law, which says a determination must be made within 30 days, even after you are determined eligible, you can wait days for the money to come through. 
Whatever you are in heart-rending, desperate, obvious need with a sick baby on your lap does not matter. People can fake heart-rending, desperate, obvious need. That possibility guides the entire department as well as the local, state, and federal policies. For the poor, there is no honor system like the one that guides paying taxes. No innocent until proven guilty like in the criminal justice system. No siree Betsy. More often than not, it was quite the opposite. There was a woman who had been raped and was being denied welfare for refusing to comply by naming the father. Father? Who the hell were they talking about? This young woman was leaving her infant home alone in a makeshift apartment in someone's attic while she worked a few hours a night in an all-night diner. She was taking home $41 a week. She called in tears. She simply couldn't make it on $41 a week. If the welfare system worked the way it should, it would still not give people enough to live on. But securing and keeping what little it is possible to get would be difficult for an FBI agent. For instance, since the rape victim had only $41 a week for herself and her child, she was eligible for the difference between what was paid on her job and the amount set for a welfare grant for two people. However, when asked who the father of her child was, she was in an impossible bind. He had told her neither his name nor his address during the rape, and she'd never seen him before in her life. Her inability to supply his name drove the caseworker into a paroxysm of doubt. If she had known who the father was, and he was not providing for the child, even if they were married, she would still have been eligible for welfare. Once the worker was dissatisfied with the answer to the name that father question, whole avenues of questions followed. Among them, had she reported the rape to the police? She hadn't. Now the worker felt justified in rejecting the application or postponing action until the woman went to the police to report a rape that had occurred over a year ago, securing proof of the report in the process. As you might imagine, this intrusion on their day-to-day -day work does not make the police happy and can, and usually does, evolve into another hassle. Though the welfare is required to assist the applicant in obtaining documents that might be difficult for her to obtain on her own, this assistance is rarely given. Reluctantly, she went to the police, who resisted the paperwork. She called me from the police station, frustrated by another bureaucracy. I had to pressure them to give her a statement verifying that she made the report, which they thought was crazy given the time lapse. Then it was back to the welfare department for the next round. We hoped she had satisfied them, but they wouldn't say. She was told only that she would hear by mail. This time, they rejected her for lack of an address at which to contact a man whose name she did not know, and so on and on. In cases like these, the only way an applicant usually gets through the maze is by getting the aggressive intervention of an advocate or friend who knows the rules and how to enforce them, or by going to court, which given the dearth of lawyers who can or will take such a case, is rare. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and I hope that everyone now has a better idea of just how insane the welfare system is set up as long as it has conditions. Conditions mean bureaucrats, and whether you think that that means that the bureaucrats must follow the law, in often case the bureaucrats don't even know what the law is, and there is a lot of power in the ability of bureaucrats to decide what they want to do or not want to do, depending on whatever they feel like that day. Now a lot of this is different now compared to what it was then, but it's also very much the same. I've seen and heard these similar stories many, many times. So even though it's not exactly the same, I hope that you have a better idea now of why it's so important to replace conditional welfare systems with unconditional based income. And I also hope that you get a hold of this book, Tyranny of Kindness, and uh, read the whole book. I haven't even read it yet, but uh, I can tell that uh, it's definitely something that people need to read just from uh, what even you have heard now. So with that, uh, I'm signing off, and uh, thank you for listening to this well longer episode, and I hope you found it very informative and hopefully upsetting as well. Thank you.